Right, so the objective today is pretty fundamental. It extends far outside magnetic resonance to pretty much anything in quantum physics, and better kind of molecular dynamics. We will be learning today to solve Schrodinger's equation. And not the kindergarten time-independent versions that you've been looking at so far, but the full, honest, proper time-dependent Schrodinger's equation that Schrodinger himself had derived. It's also applicable, the methods that we will cover today, to a lot of linear chemical kinetics. So I will keep um, a parallel record of the two types of equations. Uh, but if we look at them, right, so linear time evolution, under linear ODEs, then Schrodinger's equation for the wave function, so d psi of t by dt, is minus i h psi of t, where psi is either a function or a vector, and the Hamiltonian is correspondingly either an integral differential operator or a matrix, is pretty similar to what you would have in chemical kinetics. dc by dt is kc, where c is a vector of concentrations of whatever substances you have, and k is the kinetic matrix giving you the rate constants of the various reactions. You can see, apart from this being specifically a vector, and apart from this being over the real field, therefore a special case of that, the general mathematical form is identical. And so the solutions that we will obtain today are equally applicable to both cases. Okay, so how do we solve such an equation of motion? Let us start with observing that we know nothing about this Hamiltonian. We will assume it to be time independent in this lecture. The time dependent case is a bit more complicated, but essentially that's a static integral differential operator or a static matrix that we know nothing about. We do know that the wave function is expected to be well behaved, expected to have all of the derivatives, and why don't we start with making use of that and writing Psi out as a Taylor series, and then hopefully we will be able to fish those derivatives out of somewhere eventually. Okay, so Psi of t as per our usual univariate Taylor series expansion is a sum from n0 to infinity, psi n's derivative computed at 0 over n factorial, and then t to the power n. That is the standard Taylor series, or well, Maclaurin series in this case. Which means in practice that, okay, this is psi of 0 plus psi prime computed at 0 t plus psi double prime, so a half here, and psi double prime of 0 t squared, and so on, the standard Taylor series. What do we know about these derivatives? Well, psi naught is just the initial condition, so we know that in order to compute something, we need to know where we are starting from, so this is known. Psi prime comes straight out of Schrodinger's equation. Notice here this is the time derivative of psi. And so if we want that computed at zero, then it's minus i h psi of zero, but psi of zero is known, and so the first derivative also appears to be known. Okay, so let us collate all of that here. So psi not known then psi prime of zero from Schrodinger's equation minus i h psi of zero. Okay, that we also now know. What about psi double prime? Psi prime prime computed at zero. Well, why don't we take another derivative of Schrodinger's equation? So we know that the first derivative is this, 
that the Hamiltonian is static, so if we differentiate both sides of that again, we are going to have second derivative here and first derivative there. So that will be minus i h psi prime of zero. But that we know from the previous line, and so that is minus i h squared psi of zero, and psi of zero is the initial condition. And so we can just keep on doing this. We will have psi <coughs> triple prime after exactly the same arithmetic minus i h cubed psi naught. And so, so it turns out we actually do know all of the derivatives that we need there. In particular, psi n's derivative at zero will be s per here minus i h to the power n psi naught. So why don't we just plug it there and see what is going to happen. So recollecting the sum n zero to infinity, replacing this with the expression that we have just found minus i h to the power n. I will put t n here as well over n factorial and then psi naught in the end. Okay, uh, let us merge these two powers together. That is the sum n0 to infinity minus i h t to the power n over n factorial psi naught. And then let's take a closer look at what we have under that sum. I will remind you the expression for the exponential. That is n from 0 to infinity x to the power n over n factorial. That is actually precisely what we have under that sum. And therefore, we can recollect that sum and say that that is e to the minus i h t psi naught. And to put the first and the last thing together, this is our psi of t. And this merits a little bit of philosophy. See what we have here. This is our wave function at some future time t. This is our wave function at the beginning. And that is an operator that takes us forward in time. So it propagates us forward. And so it is for that reason called propagator. More specifically, in this case, an exponential propagator. The second thing that is unusual about this is we have a matrix under the exponential. And if we just started with that, it would not have been terribly clear how to compute it. But thankfully, we have our definition here. Right? We expand it in the Taylor series. Matrix powers, we know how to take. And so we just instruct a computer to sum this up until the next term in this series is smaller than the machine precision, at which point we have computed it to sufficient accuracy. And this will always happen because we have the factorial in the denominator that grows extremely rapidly as a function of n. And formally speaking, uh, using the language that we've, we've used in your mathematics course, this Taylor series has an infinite convergence radius. So no matter what we put underneath, at some point this will converge. Okay, so we actually now know how to solve Schrodinger's equation in full generality. And we know where the Hamiltonians are coming from. We did that in the previous lecture. So we take our Hamiltonian, we multiply it by the desired time that we would like our state to be at. We tell the computer to calculate us this matrix exponential. We multiply it into the initial condition, and that is our wave function at time t. 
plus or minus a few efficiency tweaks. This is how time domain quantum mechanics is done in the 21st century. So if you look at modern software from 2024, this is literally how wave functions are being computed there. There are various ways to do this exponential more efficiently than just exponentiating it by brute force. You can approximate it in various ways, but that is literally modern time domain quantum mechanics. Spectroscopy, quantum technology, magnetic resonance, MRI, everything uses this formulation. And then, of course, back to chemical kinetics. What also follows from all of that is the concentration vector at time t will be the exponential of kt times the concentration vector at time zero, which is also, if you look at it, incredibly powerful. Remember how much trouble you had solving those differential equations for systems of first-order chemical reactions. They were quite painful. You had to do all those indeterminate coefficients and all of that integration and so on. Here, you just need to know the matrix of the reaction rates, tell the computer to exponentiate it. These are your initial concentrations. These are your concentrations at time t. That's it, right? So uh, this language in general, the language of matrix exponentials is called Lie group theory. We do not have time uh, anywhere in your chemistry program to cover Lie groups, but they're immensely powerful. If you go on to work in this professionally, you would do well to study the subject by yourself. Okay, so we now know how to solve Schrodinger's equation. If h is time dependent, we can simply proceed in tiny little time steps and then assume that h is time independent in that little time step. This is how that is normally done. But let us solve something practical, like a spin in a magnetic field, and demonstrate fully quantum mechanically this time without any approximations at all that the spin does indeed recess around the applied magnetic field. And that would be a nice illustration to this formalism that we have just built. Okay, example. Our Hamiltonian is going to be the external field of an NMR instrument, so omega SZ, where SZ is a 2 by 2 matrix of spin half. So we are going to have omega and then one half, zero, zero, minus one half. Our initial conditions will be spin that is on the z-axis or on the x-axis or on the y. And this is something we need to figure out because the relationship between the two-dimensional vector that serves as a wave function here and the observables isn't terribly obvious. Why don't we try various initial conditions? So let's say our psi naught is going to be 1, 0. Well, we intuitively remember, right, because this was alpha and this was beta, that that corresponds to the spin which is on the uh, direction of the magnetic field. But let's just double check. So we will do psi naught s z psi naught and if we do this put it in so that is going to be the conjugate transpose version one zero then one half zero zero minus one half and then one zero then that times that is a half, that times that is a zero, then we've got a vector half zero multiplying that, that is indeed one half. So the projection on the z-axis of that initial condition is one half. And if we do it for the, for example, sx, psi naught, then the same arithmetic will quickly convince us that that is zero. So we do know the initial condition for the z axis. Let us now take a look at a different vector. I will try something else. I will try psi naught that is like that. 1 over root 2, 1, 1. Remember this came out in our workshop last week when we were computing eigenvectors of Sx and Sy. That This was one of the eigenvectors of Sx. So I have a nagging suspicion that this has um, a spin pointing somewhere along the x-axis or on the negative direction of the x-axis, but let's find out. So 
let's call it psi naught x and find out z corresponding observable for x so this is z z so psi naught x s x psi naught x will be z vector conjugate transpose and i'll just stick the half in front so that it doesn't get in the way one one then zero one half one half zero and then one one that times that is a half that times that is a half 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 times one one is one and then the result is one half so yes indeed this is the spin pointing on the x-axis and if we do likewise for the y and the z we will see that the corresponding projections are zero so we do know what initial condition keeps our spin on the z and what initial condition has it on the x and now let us propagate this forward in time using the formalisms that we have just derived and see what's going to happen the first thing that we must do is calculate that exponential we don't have a computer we only have a piece of chalk so we will now have to sum up that Taylor series so the propagator and it is a function of time and it is an operator is an exponential of the Hamiltonian times uh, the minus i times the time so we are going to have minus i omega t times one half zero zero minus one half okay let us use the definition of the exponential that will be a sum n zero to infinity one over n factorial then this entire beast to the power n so i will pull that inside the matrix minus i omega t over two to the power n then zero zero plus i omega t over two to the power n so far so good what i'll do next is i will pull this multiplier inside the matrix and of course the matrix is diagonal in here so everything is quite easy and i will also put the sum inside the matrix too so what we have is a more complicated looking matrix sum 0 to infinity minus i omega t over 2 to the power n over n factorial 0 0 and then another sum here n 0 to infinity plus i omega t over 2 over n factorial but these are exponentials themselves notice that they have exactly the same form as our exponential taylor series has at the top of that board except the frequencies have been halved so this is e minus i omega t over 2 0 0 e plus i omega t over 2 and that's our propagator relatively trouble free for this two by two diagonal matrix if we had some off diagonal elements like we would with the strong j coupling or the matrix was bigger we wouldn't have gotten off so lightly you do start to need computers here and of course remember the dimension of this matrix goes as two to the n with the number of spins and that is my day job finding out how to compute these things efficiently when n goes into thousands because two to the thousand is a lot of numbers yeah? right we have the propagator so let us use this relation here to find our wave functions well state vectors in this case at some future point so starting with the z initial condition so case one initially on z so our wave function at time t is going to be the propagator all the way to time t applied to the initial condition where the spin was sitting on the z-axis 
that is that thing there e minus i omega t over 2 0 0 e plus i omega t over 2 times our initial condition 1 0 that times that is this exponential that times that is 0 so e minus i omega t over 2 0 notice that the wave function does depend on time interestingly when we now compute the observable well wait and see so we have psi of t s z psi of t so the observable corresponding to the z projection of the spin psi conjugate transpose will transpose this vector and put a plus in front of the i e plus i omega t over 2 0 then 1 half 0 0 minus 1 half and then the vector itself omega 2 over t 0 that times this is just half the vector all right so that will be e plus i omega t over 2 0 and then this vector is e minus i omega t over 2 0 and then 1 half goes in front that times that the plus cancels the minus and we simply have that cancelling this and so we just have one there times one half that's one which is a bit strange right notice that the phase of the wave function oscillates rapidly and still the observable does not it is stuck actually half of course not one it is stuck on the z-axis this is an example of what we call in quantum mechanics a gauge degree of freedom for various very deep philosophical reasons the phase of an individual wave function has no bearing on the physical observables at all it's the internal parameter of the formalism that we have chosen for quantum theory and it does not correspond to any observable quantity there are a few of these things there's the overall phase of the wave function in quantum mechanics um, there's the vector potential in electrodynamics uh, there's gauge origin in magnetism there are a few of them in particle physics these are quantities which exist inside a physical theory but do not influence the physical reality they're called gauge quantities and you've just met one of them okay and if we do the same for the x and the y because well you can probably tell already right the whole of the spin projection is along one axis so there's nothing left for the rest of them and if we do the same for the sx or the sy psi of t we will get zeros so this is the spin just sitting on the z-axis and not doing anything things get a bit more interesting if we put it initially on x so case two initially on x exactly the same thing so our psi of t will be the propagator times the initial conditions that we have picked there i will put one over root two in front of everything so e minus i omega t over two zero zero e plus i omega t over two then one one that's going to be one over root two that times that is this exponential so e minus i omega t over 2 that times that is this exponential e plus i omega t over 2 and well we have some complicated time dependence in the wave function and let us calculate the observables corresponding to sx and sy now so psi of t sx psi of t will be 1 over root 2 1 over root 2 i'll just put the half in front then this thing conjugate transpose e plus i omega t over 2 e minus i omega t over 2 then the operator between them sx 
0, 1 half, 1 half, 0, and then the wave function itself, e minus i omega t over 2, e plus i omega t over 2. Well, a little bit of matrix vector multiplication here, 1 half e plus dot dot dot, e minus dot dot dot, I will not rewrite uh, that. That times this is one half of this exponential, so e plus and then e minus and another half coming out in front, so that becomes a quarter. And let us now multiply that by that. So e plus e plus simply twice the argument. So a quarter and then e just minus uh, the plus i omega t plus i omega t plus that times that the second term is twice the minus e minus i omega t. And remember Euler's expression for the cosine, the cosine omega t was e plus plus e minus over 2. Uh, it's uh, 1 multiplier of 2 here. That's a cosine of omega t over 2. So 2 is the magnitude and cosine is the rotation motion. If we do exactly the same for the sy, we will get the sine. And so, yes, this is the spin that is precessing in the xy plane. And if we do all of the arithmetic for this wave function for the sz, we will get a zero, reflecting the fact that the spin stays in the xy plane, because this quantum mechanical treatment so far is unitary and does not account for relaxation. Right? So we have spin precessing indefinitely in this case because we have not built in any energy dissipation into this theory. Okay, so intermediate summary for this is we now know how to solve time-dependent Schrodinger's equation and incidentally a large class of chemical kinetics problems as well. Quite easy, the solution is the matrix exponential of the Hamiltonian applied to the initial condition. The derivation is slightly lengthy, but nothing extraordinary either. And then we decided to put that to good use for a single spin, which we have put into a magnetic field. And so the Hamiltonian just contains the Zeeman interaction. And then we remembered from our workshop that that was the eigenvector of the SZ and therefore corresponds to spin sticking up or down the z-axis. That was the eigenvector of the SX, likewise. And we computed the propagator by exponentiating the matrix just manually. Again, didn't have too much difficulty with it and obtain the propagator. Then we started from this initial condition, which is on the z, and realized that, well, the spin just stays there and doesn't do anything much. And then we have started with the spin on the x and noticed that the x projection has a cosine time dependence. If we do the corresponding y, it will have the sine time dependence. And so that is our precession. And in the process of doing all of that, uh, I think you chemists have made your, met your first gauge degree of freedom, which exists in the theoretical calculations, depending on the model you choose, but does not influence any practical observables. And that is the wave function phase. So the second thing that we will do today actually is, to some extent, a necessity that is brought about by that phase. Of course, we never really have a single spin. We would not be able to detect it. These days, with sophisticated optical detection techniques, by repeating the experiment several times, you can occasionally see the magnetization or some indirect effects of a single spin. But more often than not, in practical daily magnetic resonance, we work with ensembles, something like 10 to the 20 molecules. And of course, using the wave function formalism for 10 to the 20 molecules 
is possible on paper, but the moment you start computing any of that, that's not going to happen. So we need to find a way to describe averages, preferably thermodynamical averages over large ensembles. And so welcome to quantum thermodynamics and uh, meet my best friend. Again, that's my day job, pushing these things around, the density matrix. Let us think what kind of modifications we would need to do ensemble averaged quantum mechanics. Well, we know our observables. So for some operator O, we have Psi, O, Psi. And if we would like to have the average of this over some ensemble, well, we just go and take it. So we put the over bar here, corresponding to, for example, running the experiment independently on all of the molecules in the sample and summing up the results. This is naturally happening in an NMR instrument because the coil detects the sample average magnetization. Okay, so we have this average. What can we do about that? Well, let's do a, a sleight of hand here. You know that that's a number, right? A number is a one by one matrix. And the trace of a one by one matrix is equal to itself, right? So we can put a trace here. Trace of that psi O psi. And in the workshop in the previous week, I had told you to prove this property of traces for a reason. Remember what we had proven there, that for a trace ABC, where ABC are such matrices or vectors, in fact, for which this multiplication is dimensionally allowed, that we can do circular permutation of operands under the trace. So this is equal to CAB. Okay, let us apply that here. We would have a trace of psi, psi, and then O. What do we mean by multiplying vectors like that? Again, uh, some years ago, I have mentioned that you can actually multiply the vectors the wrong way around. When you do them the right way around, like that, you get a number out. Yeah, this times that gets you a number. But if you do them the wrong way around, like this, if you literally follow the multiplication rules, that column by that row gets you an element here. That column by that row gets you an element here and so on. The product of two vectors the wrong way around is actually a matrix. The other way of looking at it is that this is in fact a Kronecker product. All right, so every element of that matrix multiplying every element of that and so we have this. So that object is a matrix, that object is a matrix, and a trace of that is unproblematic. Okay, what about the average now? Well, trace is a linear operation, it's a sum over, right? The trace of an average is an average of traces, and so we can pull the average inside. Trace of psi, psi, and then the average is inside the trace. But of course, the observable operator is something abstract. It does not pertain to any individual system, right? The state of the system is inside Psi. O is the same in every element of the ensemble, and so we can take it out of the ensemble average. And so finally, trace is that ensemble averaged times O. Okay, so we have encountered this strange construct. Two psi's multiplied the wrong way around to make a matrix, and then that matrix is ensemble averaged. This beast, uh, introduced if memory serves by John von Neumann, is called the density matrix. 
and let us take a good look inside uh, and that will give us a little bit of physical intuition about what we have there. Firstly, let us confirm that something like that psi, psi is in fact a matrix, right, or an operator on the space of all state vectors. Well, if we multiply it by some wave function, so if I put some wave function phi here, then that's an inner product, that's a number, so let's call it A, and so we have A psi. And that is the property of an operator, right? If that thing multiplies some wave function and gives you some other wave function, well, that's what operators do, right? So this row is clearly an operator and in our matrix representation, therefore a matrix. Let us also now take a look at its elements. Let us see what is happening there. So I will take this and I will actually introduce notation for it. So rho is psi psi. And let us assume that our wave function is expanded in some basis set. So let's say alpha 1 state 1 plus alpha 2 state 2 plus so on, where these are eigenstates of some operator. Let us think what is going to happen if we were to start looking at its various elements. So that will have a representation alpha 1, alpha 2 and so on. Now, if we start multiplying them the wrong way around, let's see what's going to happen. We have alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on, multiplying alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on, not forgetting the fact that this has to be conjugate as well as transpose, and so we have conjugation here. And from the definition we have there, or equivalently from Kronecker product, okay, so the first row of this is this entire row multiplied by alpha 1, so alpha 1, alpha 1 conjugate, and then alpha 1, alpha 2 conjugate, and so on. Then the second row is alpha 2, alpha 1 conjugate, alpha 2, alpha 2 conjugate, and so on, and so on. But remember what that is. This is the absolute square. Right? That thing is alpha 1 modulus square. Who remembers what that corresponds to, the modulus square of a coefficient in quantum mechanics? Probability. Yeah. P1. It's the probability of finding the system in the energy level 1. And at least the diagonal of the density matrix we therefore can easily understand. It's just a table of all probabilities. Now let's take a look here. That is a product of the coefficient pertaining to energy level 1 and coefficient pertaining to energy level 2. If we had an ensemble of systems in completely independent, uncorrelated quantum states, then when we took the average of this, all right, so remember the density matrix has an average on top of that, this would correspond to the correlation coefficient of those two, and so that would be zero. But if we have an ensemble of systems that are moving synchronously, then the population in the level 1 might be correlated with the population in the level 2, and so that would not be zero. In other words, if the systems are moving coherently in some way, so your entire ensemble is moving in some kind of synchrony, then that is going to be non-zero. For that reason, this is called a coherence. And that then is the physical meaning of the density matrix, and that explains the other names that von Neumann gave it. He called it statistical matrix. That's literally what it is. It's just a giant table of probabilities and correlation coefficients for your ensemble. And that predictably is why it 
turns up in ensemble descriptions of quantum systems because quantum mechanics is all about probability and statistics and so that matrix simply gives us those probabilities. Okay, one last thing we need to do is to demonstrate that this e kind of formalism is in every way equivalent to the original quantum mechanics. First, we need to find out the equation of motion for this beast. And secondly, we need to check that we can still calculate all of the observables. Okay, the equation of motion is quite easy. So, d by dt psi psi. It looks exotic, but it's just a product rule, right? So, we have d by dt psi times psi plus psi then d by dt psi. So I literally just treated this as a product and applied the product rule. But that's of course Schrodinger's equation. We know that derivative that is minus i h psi psi and that is Schrodinger's equation conjugate transpose. So that is plus, then psi, and then psi, h, and then we have the i somewhere here with a plus. Okay, taking psi, psi, uh, and i out of the bracket and reintroducing our notation for rho. So that is rho, and that is rho we have minus i h rho minus rho h another instance of a commutator this is why commutators are important in quantum mechanics minus i h commutator rho so the time derivative of the density matrix is proportional to its commutator with the hamiltonian Liouville von Neumann's equation. Joseph Liouville has rather little to do with this. He derived something very, very superficially similar in quantum mechanics um, in the 19th century. It's literally von Neumann's being polite um, about the prior art. Really, this is von Neumann's equation. Okay, so we do have the equation of motion for this. And of course, the solutions are inherited from Schrodinger's equation. If we have the density matrix that is two wave functions that are multiplied in a certain way, then we can simply just borrow the solutions that we had obtained for Schrodinger's equation and multiply them, the propagators, in on either side. So let me show you how that's done. We have our psi psi and we know that psi of t is the propagator applied to psi zero so e minus i h t psi zero here psi zero and here's the propagator conjugate i h t with a plus and so therefore the density matrix as a function of time is e minus i h t density matrix at time zero, E plus I H T. So the propagation rule for the density matrix is also quite straightforward. And uh, finally, to find out if we can do the observables, well, any observable is Psi operator Psi. The same trace trick that I have already used, trace Psi psi, circular permutation under the trace, trace O psi, psi, that's the density matrix, trace O times rho. That's it. So if we would like to find out a physical observable pertaining to our ensemble, we take the corresponding observable operator, multiply it by the density matrix, take a trace, that is our observable. And the reason why this entire
process is necessary, why we need to introduce density matrix, apart from just computational convenience that we would rather avoid doing too much mathematics, also goes back to that gauge degree of freedom, right? Remember that phase that miraculously appeared but didn't influence anything. So we have our wave function and this pesky phase, I phi, in front, where phi is an arbitrary real number. If we do an ensemble average of that, of course, every system, even if it has the same wave function, would be different by this gauge phase. And so the ensemble average of that is zero. In other words, wave functions really don't like to be averaged because, for example, they need to stay normalized. And if your different parts of the ensemble have different wave functions, then they will average something to, to something which isn't normalized. And at that point, it makes no physical sense. And therefore, we cannot use Schrodinger's equation directly for ensemble descriptions. But thankfully, this density matrix formalism provides a very nice and serviceable substitute. Okay, um, that's me. So the summary of the lecture, there's your Schrodinger's equation, that's how to solve it, and an example of solving it. In practical reality, we are dealing with ensembles, and wave functions really don't like to be ensemble averaged, but thankfully this beast called the density matrix uh, can and will uh, get itself ensemble averaged. The solutions for the equation of motion, well, the equation itself follows from Schrodinger's equation, likewise the solutions, and the calculation of the observables is also unproblematic. If we do not apply an ensemble average to this formalism, it's in every respect equivalent to the original Schrodinger's equation, contains the same information, produces the same answer, but the positive side is it can also be ensemble averaged. Diagonal elements of the density matrix are probabilities, of diagonal are correlation coefficients, and so it's a kind of statistical description of the kind that you'd expect in statistical thermodynamics, except there's now quantum mechanics under the bonnet there. Right, any questions?